Uh, the next prize we're going to be um, discussing today or have a discussion from is the Ruane uh, Prize for Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Research, which is given out on the causes, pathophysiology, treatment, and prevention of severe psychiatric uh, illnesses in children. Um, I know of no one who is uh, more deserving of this than our, our, the recipient this, uh, this year, Jay Geed, who's the chief of the brain imaging section of the child psychiatric uh, branch, psychiatry branch at uh, NIMH and an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins. Um, looking at his CV, I would guess that you are a native of North Dakota. How did I guess? He went to the University of North Dakota, where he actually was a summa cum laude, and then uh, went to medical school at University of North Dakota, so he liked it there. Um, and then went to Kansas, just down the road a little ways, to the manager uh, clinic uh, where he trained in, in psychiatry, and then at uh, Barrow Neurologic Institute in Arizona, which is extremely well known for radiology and imaging, which as I imagine what attracted you, aside from the warm weather, to go there. He then went, uh, did a fellowship in child psychiatry um, at uh, Duke before coming to the NIH. Um, he's going to be talking about something which I'm sure has been vexing all of us, all of our lives, and we're now finally going to get the answer. What is it that is different about teen brains? And I will say no more. Jay, welcome. Thanks. Thank you Don't much. disappoint me. <laughs> Yeah, simply, Jay, what are you going to talk about? I say the, the teen brain. Uh, and I tend to get these type of comments. We had a very short talk. Um, I mean, they found one. Uh, isn't that a contradiction of terms? Uh, or along this theme of search the elusive, that my next talk uh, will be a Loch Ness monster. But uh, if I could convey just one message uh, to you today, though, um, it would be that not only do teenagers have brains, and we can now look inside the living, growing brain with these technologies, but that the teen brain isn't broken. It's not defective. It's not you know, half-baked. It's, it's been exquisitely forged by evolution to have different properties than a brain of a child or the brain of an adult. But these differences have really served us very well uh, as a species. The big three behavioral changes that um, we see are increased risk-taking, increased sensation-seeking, and a move away from parents toward peers. And I think these are really deeply rooted in our biology, because it's not just humans. All social mammals um, have these three traits. And so it's probably going to be hard to sort of eliminate you know, these, these tendencies. I think it's more a matter of keeping them non-lethal. Um, sort of harnessing them, you know, for, for good uh, means. But they're part of uh, our biology, and what they have allowed us to do is to leave home. Okay? It's, it's a kind of a, an irrational decision. Some people love us, they feed us, they protect us, you know, they take care of us, provide for us. Why would you leave? Um, and I many people, you know, <laughs> these days uh, aren't leaving uh, uh, as soon as they used to. But, 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 but still, I think um, it's not sort of like a, you know, a, a, a morally right or wrong thing. It just worked better um, it, to you know, avoid inbreeding, to just you know, leave. And so it, I think that's why it's so um, uh, ingrained uh, as part of our, our behavior. This is um, near where I, I work in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian Hall of Human Origins. It's a great exhibit. but. This is part of that exhibit that it's not really featured. It's a small panel on the floor. And it looks at the relationship between brain size and climate change. And the last big change in human brain size was 500 to 800,000 years ago. Um, and what I found striking about this was what best correlates with this is not the degree of uh, coldness. It's the change itself. Um, and so before this, I was like, wow, times got really tough. It's so cold. Only the toughest and most clever could you know, survive long enough to reproduce. This suggests something different. This suggests that it was the brains that could adapt, that, that could you know, deal with these changes. So everybody in this room 
has teenage ancestors whose brains were really good um, at adapting, at, at dealing with change. And, and this is in contrast to our uh, very near uh, ancestor, genetically you know, uh, near uh, Neanderthals, who, whose brains are actually about 13% larger. They d uh, lived in very harsh climates, um, but they didn't, uh, they didn't adapt well. Their tool use didn't change at all for almost 200,000 years. Um, as most people know, there is you know, some in, uh, interbreeding where you know, we are part uh, Neanderthal. But they also didn't have teenagers. Um, and you, you can tell a surprising amount from fossilized teeth. And so if you found a Neanderthal 12-year-old tooth, they're more likely living with their own babies than their parents. Um, and so this is characterized as a surprisingly rapid growth in Neanderthals. And I think they have that wrong. What's, what's surprising is a surprisingly unrapid growth in humans. Neanderthals are much more in line with every other species. It's humans, it's a bizarrely long period where we're dependent upon caregivers. Well into the second decade of life. Um, and so that's, you know, there's prices to pay for that in terms of resources and, and, and other sort of things. But it really keeps our options open. Our brain doesn't have to lock in and specialize um, on any one thing early. We can you know, see what we're going to need, what the environment will demand. We're incredibly adaptable that way. We can live on the North Pole. We can live on the equator, everywhere in between. We can even live in outer space for a little while with technologies that our brains have developed. And so this is, I think, the, the, the trade-off that we've had of this sort of very long period of dependence um, and you know, the brain, in a sense, not finished, but you know, it not being uh, finished means it's also open for change. Um, and it's a good thing, I think, that it's uh, open to change now, especially because the environment has changed dramatically. I think we'll appreciate this even more a thousand years from now when we look back. But this idea of the digital revolution, so digits being ones and zeros, and the revolution being how much time we spend interacting with them, like we're doing this moment with the PowerPoint, right? and which, what teens are doing 11 hours a day. Um, and so I've been very interested in this you know, ability of the, the you know, brain to change and adapt, and this you know, relatively recent demand. I think, you know, I'm not sure what the right, uh, landmark would be. I, here I use the, uh, Gutenberg's popularization of the printing press, but maybe even longer than that, in terms of fundamentally changing the way we learn, the way that we play, and the way that we interact with each other. And so this has raised the uh, you know, questions about you know, what does this do to the brain? And I, I focus on adolescents, you know, not because they're the only ones with iPhones or you know, affected by these technologies, but they're in the kind of a special zone. Like they're old enough to master these technologies. And e even the teachers of computer science in school have a hard time keeping up you know, with um, the bright 14, 15 year olds who live this life. Um, and they're young enough to embrace the changes. So I think that the, it's a particular kind of a zone uh, of interest. And it raises the question is, you know, yeah, it's nice to have, you know, the technology, but is it too much in terms of has, has, it, has it gone too far? And so this is a question I've been interested in, in looking at. You know, it's, it's complicated, it's nuanced. In some ways, yes, in some ways, no. For learning, for instance, magical access to the greatest minds on the planet, usually for free. You know, Google it has become, you know, they tell my kids in school sometimes, don't do that because you don't know about quality control. So we do it all the time at work. Almost every new thing, you know, Google it and you know, see what's you known about. Most of it's you know, amazingly good. But you do have sort of a signal to noise problem in this vast ocean of information. How do you, you know, find the good from the bad? But that, I think, is a new skill that needs to be taught. Because you don't need to memorize how long a river is or how high a mountain is. You can look it up in you know, 20 seconds. But how do you know how to look it up and how to evaluate the, the sources um, and such? But the ability of these, the, the content, it's an, it is incredible. Uh, people worry then, though, does it lead to shallow thinking? Because it's so easy, it's so quick, and you don't have patience. You just you know, look it up. And I, I guess there is a possibility that could occur, but not necessarily. You can actually get you know, quite deep scholarship by following links, by following you know, one uh, lead uh, to the next. And you can also make it very individualized. 
You can reach that student exactly what they're at. They may be a third grader in math, a fifth grader in history, a second grader in English. You know, all these abilities may not be developing at the same pace, and now you can individualize it um, you know, better than ever. But it does lead to this temptation of multitasking, um, doing, doing many things at once. So uh, this is the uh, um, data from uh, 2010. It's actually gone up even more with mobile devices. Um, but almost 11 hours of the day um, with um, screen time, and 29% uh, of that with more than one thing um, at, at the same time. Exhibit A. Rocky and Anika Jane, typical 16-year-olds doing all their homework all at once, and then some. I'm working on my bedroom, chatting, I'm working on my English homework, Facebook game, trying to figure out math, doing Spanish, but then I'm also doing Facebook, and to some emails, and you chat, I'm doing two different Spanish homeworks, and, and I'm checking my math answers. Scientists call them digital natives. So at ease in a world of constant connections, experts can't help but wonder, are their brains being altered along the way? Yeah. So one thing is that you know, uh, Brock and Nika, they're, they're great kids. They've been, you know, they're twins, they've been in our study since they were little girls. Um, you know, they're, they're not atypical you know, in terms of, of this amount of time. They, they're now you know, in the colleges of their choice, they have friends, they're just, you know, you know, great kids, but their lives are you know, very much different than mine or, or other people at my age in terms of the amount of these you know, kind of digital interactions. It's also changed the way that we play. So I have three teenage sons uh, uh, and a 21-year-old daughter, but it, isn't, you know, it really has altered things a lot in terms of, of uh, the games. I used to think, well, you're a couch potato. You're not running, jumping, playing. That's what's wrong with them. But that's not even true anymore. You can, the games can be very physical. You can scale the uh, challenge as, you know, as much or as little as you like. And uh, we Fit and the Connect games. And so even that aspect you know, hasn't, uh, isn't valid anymore. Um, they're really, really fun. It's a $30 billion a year industry, uh, very competitive. The games that sell well are very you know, great at engaging the brain's reward system and keeping our, our dopamine trickling at just the right levels. Um, and so I think that the, the risk here isn't so much the games themselves doing bad things, but they compete with homework and other things. They're, they're so fun, it makes you know, getting other work done uh, less, uh, less, less tempting. There's a lot of concern about sex and violence. So the trick for sexual content is you know, not, it's not hard to find it, it's hard not to find it. Right? Anything you do online, you know, ads and stuff will come up. And the amount of violence um, has, you know, the, the games are only limited by our imagination of how violent they can be. And the amount of time with violent game uh, has gone up fourfold uh, since just 2002. So is this you know, eroding the moral fabric of our nation and stuff? And so um, unwanted teen pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, a lot of indices of sexual activity, 47 year low for as long as they've been keeping record. Real world violence, 49 year low. Again, as long as it, bizarre, right? I mean, you, you, if it was the opposite, we'd be all over this, right? Oh, of course, you know, this is why this happened. I don't know the answer to that. It's intriguing to me in terms of people say, yeah, they're not mugging you because they're in their basement, you know, they, they're uh, playing the games. Or they're, but, you know, it'll be, it's interesting. Um, it, it, the data is so different than what might have been predicted. And maybe, you know, deeper than, you know, being in the basement, that maybe they're working through these fundamental issues of, of um, you know, sex and aggression, violence that are so important part of our nature. But a lot of these things, you know, we're trying to keep up. The changes are so rapid, it's hard to get a handle on it with research about um, the difference between real world uh, effects and the, the games. Um, social interaction, so a quarter of all internet traffic is Facebook or social medias. Um, and so it really, I think, taps into a fundamental human nature. But it's, it's different, right? You're not with people physically. You're not sharing, you know, the same temperatures and, and sounds and some, you know, smells, all these things that so much of our brains are dedicated to social interactions. That's how we stayed alive as opposed to, you know, with teamwork and, get, you know, getting along with others. So is this sort of messing with something that, you know, so uh, fundamentally important? Um, one of the things that has been measured is this kind of global community. So we watch the same cats playing the piano or whatever, you know, the sharing the same funny things on YouTube and things. 
And we realize that for most cultures, they're a lot more alike than different. You know, they might have different foods or clothes or cultures, religions, but fundamentally, you know, we, we want to do well by our friends, we want to do well by our families, we're a lot more alike. And this, you know, could be a really positive aspect in terms of this idea of uh, a more global community. And, th and this is bearing out. If you look at 19-year-olds versus 24-year-olds versus 29-year-olds uh, and adults, the younger group, they're more aware of what's going on in the world. Um, they're more, less provincial. They sort of can appreciate other uh, viewpoints more. So this could actually be a, you know, a wonderful and somewhat unexpected outcome of this, of that so much of prejudice and conflict is, is ignorance. We don't understand each other. We don't um, you know, put it ourselves in terms of food. And these global communities uh, can be a step in the right direction for that. Um, but you know, it is a lot of time, again, maybe you know, away from the things that you can be doing others. Cyberbullying is very complicated, uh, whether it actually increases the amount of bullying when it happens in the media, it's very high profile. But it, there's also more accountability now because you know, what they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens on the internet you know, is there forever um, for people to see. That has a protective aspect as well. Because if you are a bully and stuff, you know, potentially you know, that's going to stay there. And, and people, it's not as anonymous as, and people get that now. The kids know that you know, it's traceable and things like that. So that's a, you know, a complicated issue. But as my, my grandmother would say, you know, it just ain't natural. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, we shouldn't be spending so much time with, with these devices. There's something just inherently you know, um, you know, wrong about it. Uh, but I point out, like, reading's not natural either. Reading is only about 5,200 years old. So for most humanity, nobody read. Um, and I think that's sort of my fundamental point, not to say, oh, video is better than reading or something like that, but that this idea about plasticity is the key. I mean, 10,000 years ago, we were hunting, gathering berries, and now we're trying to get the 12 o'clock to stop blinking on the DVR or different you know, <laughs> things like that. But, you know, but it's so different. It's so different. And 10,000 years is like a you know, blink of an eye in, in evolutionary terms. So I think this is really, for me, it's, it's the, um, the center for everything. It's like how to understand this teenage brain plasticity, which creates vulnerabilities that I'll mention in a moment, but also opportunities. And most of my work could be seen through this lens. How do we optimize the good stuff and uh, minimize the bad? And the, the study design for this is uh, admittedly very non-creative. Uh, people um, come to our lab, um, very young, now even actually in the womb, but as young as they can. Um, we get their brain scan. We get their DNA from their blood, or their saliva, or their skin cells. And we see how they're doing at home and in school, do different behavioral assessments. And then they come back in two years. Um, so that's closer to you know, 10,000 people now. A fourth are um, uh, healthy, happy, typically developing twins. A fourth are typically developing singletons. And the other half are from 30 different clinical groups like child schizophrenia, autism, um, ADHD. And this is what we've found. So this sort of summarizes the, the, the 23 uh, years of research so far, is that the, the brain doesn't mature by getting bigger and bigger. And that's what we first thought. We, oh, we're going to watch the brain grow. It's this big, you can do arithmetic. Oh, a bit bigger, now algebra. Oh, this big, calculus. So by first grade, the brain's already 93% of adult size, um, which we didn't really uh, see, see coming in terms of, oh, this is really going to be boring. We're going to watch a 7% you know, difference over 20 years. It'll be like watching a paint dry kind of thing. And it is still true. The total si size of the brain doesn't change that much, but it, the inner workings do. And, and the big changes are that it gets more connected within itself. So the different parts of the brain are sort of like letters of the alphabet. And by eight months, all the letters are there. What happens from then from a baby to, to longer is that these letters become words, the words become sentences, the sentences become paragraphs. That's how the brain um, matures. And so just as an example um, for um, the uh, connectivity part is the white matter of the brain, and it's sort of up, up, and away. It increases to about the fifth decade for women, the fourth for men, but the longer you know, we're alive and healthy, the more connected the brain becomes. And it's this connectivity that we're seeing is like key for things like schizophrenia. Um, so 
this is a very complicated slide, but just sort of makes the point, what's different in schizophrenia isn't the letters. We were looking for, like, you know, show me that hole in the brain, where's the spot in the brain? It, it, in this case, it's not even the words, it's the sentences. It's how the different parts of the brain communicate with each other. And we're just now getting a good handle with graph theory and other um, uh, math approaches from economists and astronomers, computer scientists. You know, we're all um, coming together more to um, try to capture this idea of networks and how things are connected. The other change is um, this idea of specialization. The brain grows like a tree. First, there is a flurry of growth. Then unused branches or pathways are pruned. And it is this pruning that gives the tree its shape for the future. So a, a bit you know, condescending to most of the people here, but it's, it's a powerful message for the teens themselves in terms of that what they do with their time and their choices helps uh, optimize their brain for whatever um, you know, challenge that they'll face for the next 80, you know, 90 years. And this pruning doesn't happen everywhere in the brain at the same time. It's particularly late in this part of the brain uh, called the prefrontal cortex. And this is a part of the brain involved in long-range planning, controlling impulses, you know, decision-making. And it doesn't level off to, uh, it levels to like 25 to 30. It's ridiculously late, right? We, as an adolescent psychiatrist, we thought, should we study people until 16 or 18? By 16, they're already winning Olympic medals. You know, they're pretty you know, big and, and smart. It's just sort of historically that we stretch this out. 25 wasn't even on our radar screen. Right? So like if you go to the car, uh, airport to rent a car, you have to be 25 to rent a car. Oh, you know, no, Hertz was the only people who had it right. You know, no wonder they have all the best neuroscientists, you know, kind of thing. And we kind of try to joke it away, but it, it didn't go away in terms of, um, Ron Dahl, in terms of the paradox of adolescence. You shouldn't be at the top of your game. Tolerance to heat and cold, resistance to cancer, strength, agility, everything you measure, you're at your best. Morbidity and mortality go up 300%. I mean, number one uh, is motor vehicle accidents. If you're a teenage girl and die, half the time it'll be a car accident. Two and three are suicide or homicide, depending on how people classify them. But all the top ten related to like judgment, uh, decision making. Uh, so th this part of the brain is very late, you know, to um, finish or you know get as good as it's going to get. But it's not the whole story because what's um, important is that other parts of the brain are very active at, at puberty, and these are the limbic structures of the brain resolved like for, for sexual drives, aggression, for you know, greater um, uh, passions in terms of everything is intensified. So we have this gap between the puberty activated limbic system and you know, 10 years later, the, the, frontal, the frontal lobes. And it's this, this gap um, that B.J. Case and others have kind of focused on in terms of that accounts for so many of the good and bad behaviors that, that we see in teens. But this plasticity, um, you know, it, it does come at a cost. These vulnerabilities are very real. Most illnesses emerge during adolescence. Not everything, not Alzheimer's, uh, not ADHD, not autism, but most things, over 50% versus the research um, dedicated to it, 2.3%. So adolescence is sort of a neglected uh, um, area of research. But these, these vulnerabilities, you know, um, it's puzzling, right? Why do things happen when they do? If you're born with a risk for schizophrenia, why does it wait till later? Well, people say, well, it's stress, adolescence. But lots of times in life are stressful, especially if your country's at war or you don't have food. You know, I don't think it can be just stress. So, We've been very interested in understanding typical brain development and how it might lead to these illnesses of schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. Just to take schizophrenia for an example, every finding that you see in the brain for adult schizophrenia, you could predict as saying, what happened if teen brain changes went too far? I'm not saying it's causal, but it's intriguing. Because so far, that's what, you know, I'd accept. And depression, you know, what if happened if it didn't go far enough? But, so we need to understand, you know, healthy brain development, not just, you know, to ignore the illnesses, but to understand the illnesses. And um, this is like the, these brain changes I just showed. So the brain is supposed to prune and specialize in typical teens. It's four times the rate in schizophrenia. Not four percent, four times. So in typical teen development, you lose seven percent of those gray matter connections. In schizophrenia, 28 percent. 
And so we think this, you know, again, intriguing, and not the cause of all schizophrenia, but if, if medicines can affect this process, maybe, you know, we could work back, actually lithium is a good example of a, not a primary treatment for schizophrenia, but it's very good at, at preventing pruning. Um, so not subtle. Um, and a lot of things that adolescent people deal with isn't exactly an illness, you know, like it's not a harder problem, but it's still very real. It affects people's lives, unwanted pregnancies, um, sexually transmitted diseases, car accidents, incarceration. You make decisions at this time that affect, you know, the rest of your, uh, of your life. And so that has to be part of the research as well, because so much comes down to adolescent decision making. And so, you know, is the glass half empty or half full? Yeah, well, for the teens, uh, it's less than half full, the water's dirty, the glass is cracked, and it's your fault. Um, but actually, you know, there, it, it doesn't need to be that way. There's a lot of room for optimism. Most teens do well. You know, they get through this, help um, productive, you know, adults. But it's a very powerful time for intervention. Because this is when the parts are moving. This is when, you know, before the cement is set. And, and if we can understand what's going on in typical and atypical development, I think it's a great opportunity to you know, intervene in these illnesses um, you know, right from the start. Uh, oh, that's a different talk, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's that. um, but I thank you all very much for your uh, uh, attention, um, and I'll take questions if you have any. Questions for Dr. Gig. Actually, while, while people are doing that, um, you talked about adolescence being a time of increased connectivity. When does that, you begin to lose that in adulthood? So there's this um, idea of a palindrome or last in, first out. Um, and so before childhood, I actually did geriatric psychiatry. And people say, oh, why did you, you know, that's the opposite. But it's actually not opposite at all. And they're both, you know, change over time. But this idea that the things that we acquire latest um, are the first to go in, um, in aging. And so in terms of the prefrontal um, functioning, it actually doesn't appear to peak until like 50s. Um, so if it's been studied up to 55 and not beyond, but in terms of people making the best decisions for long range consequences and stuff, so I should say at least 55. Because they, they, they studied 35, 45, and 55, and then were like, oh, you know, 55 won in a sense, and you know, they didn't look at um, beyond. So there's still, you know, quite, you know, late in life where these things are still more in the building phase um, before they um, go start the um, unbuilding. Hello. Thank you very much. I had a question about um, what do you think the role of illegal drug use has on the teen brain in terms of mental illness? Uh, you know, for example, self-medication um, and using the, the onsen the onset of mental illness. So, you know, kids in their, you know, before 16 doing drugs and then they get diagnosed yeah. at age 16 to 18, finding out that they had a mental illness. So, so the question is um, the um, impact of substances of abuse you know, on this process. And I think it's a you know, great question in terms of when I talked about the brain specializing, how does it actually do this? And it's a one-two punch, it's a huge overproduction and then they fight it out for survival. And the way that the brain keeps score, you make a good decision, it leads to good things, happiness, pleasure, dopamine goes up, it's a good call. Whatever you just did, do that again, that was good. You make a bad decision, pain, unhappiness, dopamine goes down, don't do that again, you know, that, that didn't work. And so dopamine is how the brain is keeping score. And this is a permanent process, those cells and connections that are good things, they're strengthened uh, um, and physically strengthened, the ones that are bad are physically removed. So it's how the brain is, is doing this between like 15 and 19. And every substance of abuse, and even everything of abuse, from gambling to talk, anything that we you know, do repeatedly despite bad consequences, increases dopamine um, in this part of the brain. And so it messes with the scorekeeping. The, the, the highest sort of natural dopamine dump is orgasm, which is like four to, four to five, you know, beyond. Some of the substances are, are 17, 18 times natural levels of dopamine. It just tells your brain, wow, whatever you just did, that was great. <laughs> Do that again. But it really, it, it's too much. It, it, it throws off the scorekeeping system. It sort of like sets the, the, 
hedonostat, it was called like hedonism and thermostat. And, and so many you know, people experiment at these times of life. It's tragic then that if it sets their reward level so high, they'll never reach it naturally. Nothing they do in a relationship, in their job, in their anything, you know, will come close to that. And they, you know, they're on outside, oh, a very successful person, but they kind of, something's missing in my life back here. You know, like, like I don't, you know, feel the, that joy. So it, it's sort of a, I guess, I, irony that right at this time, the, probably the worst possible time to be messing with dopamine systems is when societal and other reasons that you're doing it. So uh, I, thank you so much. And just one more question with that. When uh, people, have you seen in research that pe children and teens taking drugs, that it's indicative of development of certain me mental illnesses, like it precipitated the onset of a mental illness? It's, yeah, it's again, it's a, it's a, uh, the question is, you know, the, the um, drugs, you know, triggering mental illnesses. And surprisingly, not really well under, no. Uh, people said, well, maybe people were kind of self-medicating, you know, early in the process. You know, is it causal? The correlation is there. Um, and so it's a really you know, good question in terms of does it, um, is it a cause or an effect? You know, does it um, just push some people over the edge, but they you know, would have occurred you know, anyway? Uh, one of the really good unanswered uh, questions. Last nice question over here. Yeah. Oh, two questions. Yeah. because uh, you, you can't separate uh, the effects of the substance from whether or not they have a bipolar disorder, for example. It's hard to know the difference, so you have to wait and see what, how they are when they're off the drugs. But if you don't mind, I'd like to give some information because I recently heard a man named Dr. Stephen Dewey, D-E-W-E-Y, uh, speak about the effects on the adolescent brain of substances of abuse. He does research at the Feinstein Institute, which is on, at North Shore LIJ Hospital. You can go online and Google him, and there's a video that uh, is about 40 minutes long where he shows slides, pets, uh, PET scan slides of the human brain, and the dopamine is visualized, and you can see the effects of all substances of abuse on the, on the brain, and he particularly is focusing on adolescents, but he does all humans. And it's something to show your adolescence because it makes a statement all on its own. Thanks. Dr. Stephen Dewey, okay. D-E-W-E-Y. Last question up here, up on the doctor. I just had a question in terms of uh, trauma and adolescence. Did you notice any difference? And I don't know if you had anyone in your study or any children in your study that had undergone some significant trauma if that affected the brain development in any way? Yeah, tra trauma at you know, any ages does affect um, uh, brain development, but the, the optimism in that, though, is that the ability to recover from uh, those, those traumas is, is strong, you know, biologically. Sometimes people say, well, it's a lost cause or things that happened in childhood, you know, you can't do anything about it now. It may be difficult, but biologically that's not true. So even if the trauma triggered you know, these changes, that they, the brain can recover to remarkable you know, degrees from, um, from those sort of things. But definitely you know, trauma is one of the, you know, the things that affects development in brain and um, behavior more than, than anything else. Um, we just don't understand why the same trauma can affect different people so differently. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Sir.